Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus today. My name is Trace, and this is episode one of five in our series this week on domestication of animals. How did we start doing this? When did we start doing this? Did it benefit us? Did it benefit the animals? We're gonna get into all of these different things, so make sure you subscribe for this week's episodes, and then you can get next week's and the week after and the week after that. Or if you don't wanna watch them here on YouTube, you can find the podcast over on iTunes and subscribe there, get an audio version of this whole series squished into one. So you can find a link to that in the description. You can also come find the show over on Twitter. I am at Trace Dominguez. The show is at TestTube. So let's talk about domestication. When did we become separate from animals? That was the first question that I had when my producers and I were sitting down to talk about this. At what point did we start to think of ourselves as separate from an animal? So thus we could use the animal to get our own food, to help us hunt, to do all of these other things. You know, we're not just another animal, we're somehow better. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying when did that happen? The act of humans taking animals from the wild is domestication. Over time, we make those animals dependent on us and we adapt them over generations to fit our needs, like a work animal or a pet. Encyclopedia Britannica puts it this way, the initial stage of human mastery of wild animals and plants is domestication. Man has always had a relationship with animals, just as all animals have relationships with each other. But there is evidence that horses were domesticated in 3500 BC, and dogs were being kept as pets maybe 30,000 years ago, prior to what we would call history. But there is evidence that we've been eating meat for 1.8 million years, which brings us back to that time that we started thinking of ourselves as different from the animals around us. Scientists found a child's skull in Tanzania, and it was similar to skulls of people suffering from malnutrition, a low meat diet, which means at the time, meat was a steady part of our ancestors' diet. And there's evidence that early humans would make and use tools to hunt and kill animals. This was 500,000 years ago. So this is showing already the separation between human and animal. And by this time, we'd already started to make these tools and cook meat over fires. And that helped us develop bigger brains and become more and more evolved over time. Watch our episode about fire, it's super awesome. And we used our knowledge of those tools and how our brains were getting bigger and bigger. And we used that knowledge to get meat more easily. We didn't wanna to have to go around and forage for meat. We didn't wanna scavenge for meat. You wanna just have it, make it easier on yourself, you know. We're lazy. <laughs> we are now more dominant over animals than any time in human history. And I like to think when early man identified their supremacy in the animal kingdom has to do with when we started building tools and hunting them and, and kind of saying, this is our food source, right? Early man respected animals, but they also used them. And you can see this through early human art. This is when our reliance on animals really started. And as soon as we became superior to animals, we didn't just eat them and then leave them for nature. We started using the pieces of animals for other things. Bones became parts of society. We, we use them for tools. We use them to sew clothing with bone needles. We even were still using bone combs and things into the 19th century. And we also were using the animal pelts as clothing for ourselves to advance our own ability to survive in hostile environments. So let's fast forward to our next relationship with animals. We didn't just go and hunt them and then use their pelts and their bones and all of their pieces. We started taking them out of the wild where it was very unpredictable and started bringing them closer to ourselves so we could breed them and do what we wanted to do with them ultimately, which is not have to go find them in the woods and put them nearby. Uh, we were making them work for us instead of against us. Isn't it easier to go get a pig, guide it to the slaughterhouse and use its parts and its meats rather than chase and hunt down a wild boar. The first animals to be domesticated were not horses and were not pigs and you know were not any of those, but were in fact probably dogs. No one really knows for sure. One scientist claims that a snail was technically the first domesticated animal, one guy, but most archaeologists and scientists agree that it was probably the dog, the domesticated dog, which came from, you probably already know, the wolf. 
And some scientists were using something called the molecular clock to determine how old domesticated dogs actually are. What point in their genetic history that they split from the wolf. So think of it this way. Take the DNA of a wolf, take the DNA of a dog, and compare the two. They're very different. They have a number of different mutations. So we look at those mutations, and then we go back a couple generations with maybe some DNA that we found in history, so, you know, something like that. We'll look at that DNA. Then we'll look at DNA even further back and further back. The molecular clock is a way to trace that species and see where the two split off from each other. Basically, they're looking for changes in their gene sequence and finding the spot where if you go back and back and back and back and back, the things get closer together, mutations lessen, and you see that one point where a mutation split them off from each other. So separating from species, that's just one step in this process. Being domesticated, that's a completely different thing. We do know that dogs originated from ancient wolves, and for a long time people thought that that started 15,000 years ago. The oldest known dog fossil was about 14,000 years old. But scientists, based on molecular clock DNA evidence, think that it may have happened even further back, almost twice as far at 30,000 years ago. Based on DNA evidence, some scientists look at the shape of the skulls of the dogs, and they look at how the wolf became domesticated and its physical aspects and how that changed over time. Possibly it could have even been 33,000 years ago. Today, if you look at a dog and you look at a wolf, they don't just look different on the outside. They have different skeletal structures. There's DNA differences, but there are links between, say, Siberian Huskies and the Siberian Wolf. Another study compared the ancient skulls of wolves to modern dogs and coyote skulls, and they think that it may have happened between 18,000 and 32,000 years ago. So when it happened isn't exactly known, nor is it particularly important for our purposes. But currently, scientists think that if the DNA evidence points to a certain area of around 30,000 years and the skull evidence is about that, that's a pretty good place to start. I think more interestingly, there are a couple of different stories of how those ancient wolves became domestic dogs. Originally, we thought that man had gone out and taken a wolf pup and raised it as his own. Uh, you know, and over time, that wolf had pups and they became more domesticated because the men would raise them and then so on and so on down the line. But that's not really the agreed upon theory anymore. It makes us seem really awesome, but it's not particularly scientifically supported. Many think that wolves likely domesticated themselves. See, ancient men started living in smaller groups. They perfected the art of hunting, they had tools, and they could go out and get food. And they didn't need every single little piece of that food the way that they maybe had hundreds of thousands of years ago. So wolves would hang around these human camps in order to eat the scraps. They would scavenge human trash because it was a lot easier than going out and hunting for themselves. You can see evidence of this in animals all across modern society. Seagulls don't necessarily live by the sea. They seem to live in the parking lots of various big box stores. Early dogs were basically like that. They started hanging out places that they knew they could get food easily. And over time, wolves became more and more used to humans just being around. They learned to get food not from the wild, not from the hunt, but just from these humans nearby. And generation after generation of that, eventually they learned to work with the humans, eventually learning to help them locate animals to hunt and kill because it was a benefit to both of them, or protecting the camp from other dangerous animals and also by that way, protecting their own food source. So thinking about it that way, which wolves do you think then became the dogs that we have today? likely the ones that were the least aggressive and the friendliest towards the humans in the camp. Not the ones that were aggressive because we would have never taken them in. Instead, the friendly ones got more food. They were the ones who had an advantage now. Man, as hunters, and people who don't like to be eaten, would then be nice to those wolves and it would end up producing more and more friendly wolves. Over time, the dog domesticated itself with our help. As they would breed and we would feed, <laughs> they would become more and more like the dogs that we have today. And of course, all of these are guesses, they're theories, hypotheses. No one really knows for sure, but it does seem to make sense and it's kind of fun to think about. What do you guys think? Do you think that it's more we grabbed an animal out of the wild and raised it as our own, or are you on board with the dog sort of did this themselves? Let us know down in the comments. Make sure you come back tomorrow for more Test Tube Plus, because tomorrow we're gonna talk about how once we've domesticated an animal, 
that completely changes human society. Imagine having access to a wolf or two and how that could change that camp of humans. What we could do now that we couldn't do before. That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. So make sure you come back for that. Come find us over on Twitter. You can find the show at TestTube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. And thanks for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs>